Hello, and welcome back to the Arcane Forge. My name's Josh, and today I want to talk to you about the Feywilds. On this channel, the Arcane Forge, I like to draw creatures and things in general, being an illustrator, that I find really fascinating in D&D, and I like to talk about them in massive, massive detail because I'm a huge nerd. That has all culminated in today's video being the beginning of a kind of fey themed February. February? Something along those lines? And with a month of fey themed content, I wanted to talk about what the Fey Wilds are exactly, the realm of the Fey, because we know that's where you go if you want to meet fairies and fair folk. But when I was first trying out the DM's cowl, I found that I had no really solid ground on which to start describing what it's like inside the Fey Wilds. So I wanted to do a bit of research, do a bit of drawing, and come up with something that we can all use. So I hope you enjoy my research and my illustration, and let's get started with today's video. The Feywild, also called the Plain of Feyri, is a land of soft lights and wonder, a place of music and death. It is a realm of everlasting twilight, with glittering fairy lights bobbing in the gentle breeze and fat fireflies buzzing through groves and fields. The sky is alight with the faded colours of an ever-setting sun, which never truly sets or rises for that matter. It remains stationary, dusky and low in the sky. Away from the settled areas ruled by the Seely Fey that compose the Summer Court, the land is a tangle of sharp-toothed brambles and syrupy fens, perfect territory to the Unseely Fey to hunt their prey. The Feywild exist in parallel to the Material Plane, an alternate dimension that occupies the same cosmological space. The landscape of the Feywild mirrors the natural world, but turns its features into spectacular forms. Where a volcano stands on the material plane, a mountain topped with skyscraper-sized crystals that glow with internal fire towers in the Feywild. A wide and muddy river on the material plane might be echoed as a clear and winding brook of great beauty. A marsh could be reflected as a vast black bog of sinister character. And moving to the Feywild from old ruins on the material plane might put a traveller at the door of an archfey's castle. At least, that's what we're told in the Dungeon Master's Guide for 5th edition, so I hope you don't mind me reading verbatim from that section of the book there. But I want to explore the Feywilds in more depth. That's pretty vague and fairly open to interpretation, but let's see how better we can inform ourselves on the nature of the Feywilds. The Feywilds can be interpreted in many different ways, but one of the things that's always made this a little difficult for me is this idea of a world that mirrors the natural world but turns its features into spectacular forms. Like, how spectacular are we talking exactly here? Are we going for a walk in the woods with really big trees, or are we on some alien planet? In many ways, descriptions like this are deliberate. They're vague enough for the Dungeon Master to be able to imprint their own ideas and themes on this plane of existence to get creative and come up with something for their players to enjoy. But while that's really fun, if you're unfamiliar with the Fey, or even if you're a new Dungeon Master who wants to explore the Fey Wilds with your players, then you can easily get lost in the magnitude of conjuring your own plane of reality. Is there weather? Does gravity or magic still work? Do we still need to eat when we travel through to this reality? Is it densely populated, or do the players feel all alone and isolated? Some of the clues that we can start to use to build up our picture of the Feywilds are that the Fey are roughly comparable to other extraplanar realms, like those that the celestial creatures, like angels, or the fiendish creatures, like demons, might call home. I think we can all imagine some oblivion-like plane of reality where demons or devils would feel comfortable, or the Olympian clouded peaks of a divine afterlife. The Feywilds need to have a similar level of epicness, but whereas the Hells, or Heavens, and their equivalents in D&D are inspired by Abrahamic mythology associated with Jewish, Christian, or Islamic faith, the Feywilds find their roots in Celtic, Norse, and Pagan mythology. When you think about the types of creatures who call the Feywilds home, 
Hags, elves of various kinds, changelings, trolls, pixies, redcaps, goblins, gnomes, brownies, kelpies, and so on. Most, if not all, of these creatures have their roots in Celtic, Norse, or some kind of pagan culture and myth. These are fundamentally pre-Christian, European, and Slavic folktales, and superstitions come to life. And the Feywilds reflect this influence in a major way. D&D also likes to throw in elements of the spirit world and the yokai who live there, drawing influence from ancient eastern folk stories, with particular focus on Japanese stories from the Edo period and even before. Moreover, the word feiri may very well have its roots in ancient Persian mythology, according to Barthélemy de Bellot, a 17th century Parisian historian who postulated that trade and travel between nations in the pre-Islamic era of Persia may have caused tales of the peri, P-E-R-I, fair, beautiful, and extravagant nature spirits that were supported by wings to be picked up by ancient Germanic cultures in what would become Europe, influencing their folklore and stories. The word fairy has connotations of mystery, magic, unsettling power, and otherworldliness. In Old French, the word fee, a pronunciation for fairy still used in modern German, I believe, meant a medicine woman, skilled in magic and great knowledge of nature, of herbs and salves. But it also meant fated to die or doomed in earlier Germanic languages. This might seem like a tangent, but this can hugely inform our picture of the Feywilds. They're dangerous magical, mysterious, full of nature spirits, but fundamentally not positive or negative. They're a place that humans fundamentally don't belong, at least in life. But given the right respect, they might be a source of healing or even of some other kind of power. The Feywilds in D&D, also known as Feyri, take their name from medieval and Arthurian legends of the home of Fey folk also sometimes known as Fairyland. But before this time, the land of fairies was commonly known by the Old Norse term Alfheim, or Alfheim in the anglicised version, which means elf home to you and me. This was also Norse shorthand for Ljossalfeimer, the home of the light elves, which was very different to Svartalfheim, the home of the dark elves. Fascinatingly enough, this was considered not only to be a very real and physical place, but it was actually mapped out and ruled over by ancient people. Alfheim, the land of the elves, or at least a gateway perhaps to the land of the Fey, is now known as Boslan, on the western coast of Sweden. Alfheim is described in Norse mythology as a place of light and beauty whose residents are more radiant even than the sun incredibly powerful and glowingly beautiful demigods worthy of reverence, but also worth respecting. This radiant perfection definitely informs the elvish realms of Rivendell in The Lord of the Rings and the woods of Lothlorien, home to the similarly glorious Galadriel. Tolkien was famously an Anglo-Saxon scholar. Their mythology and legends were inspired in no small part by Norse roots. I think that it's in Lothlorien that the Feywilds gain a huge amount of their visual elements. It's densely forested, reclaimed by nature, but guarded by silent, stealthy assassins, home to mysterious and wild forces that we cannot hope to control. Ancient beings who might read your mind, invade your thoughts whose customs you must uphold. If Legolas the Elf was not among the party, the Fellowship would likely have been slain long before realising they were even encroaching on Galadriel's kingdom. But talking about the behaviour and residence of the Feywild is something that I'd like to cover in a separate video. While the Feywilds definitely take influence from ancient European folklore, we can't ignore the influence that fractionally more modern fairy tales, as the name suggests, have had on our understanding of fairies and, by extension, their place and plane of existence. Fairies, better known as the fair folk to ancient tongues, were spirits incompatible with the rise of Christianity. By the 1700s, Christians had well and truly spread to eclipse most other traditional faiths in Eastern and Western Europe, and our cultural perceptions of fairies 
largely waned in significance. The creatures who were once revered as demigods, or at least figures of reverence and respect, were given a fairly brutal PR campaign by the clergy for fear of alternative religions competing with Christian doctrine resulting in fairies and other creatures being cast as either demons to be feared and shunned, or as lesser, more harmless sprites who may still exist, but weren't worthy of worship at least. Stories of the fae still occupied popular culture in these regions though. Fairy tales, folk stories, or as they were known in Germany at the time, Märchen, or wonder tales in English. I have to thank Bootsy, our resident German translator there. Thank you so much, Bootsy over on our Discord for helping me with the pronunciation there, which reminds me that if you'd like to get more out of the channel and you'd like to say hi, we have a Discord, the links to which are down below in my description box, and that's open to absolutely everyone. So come and join in and say hi. But anyway, while these stories were incredibly prevalent, these weren't uniformly or canonically consistent until Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm started cataloguing and publishing their gruesome folktales in the 1780s as children's stories, believe it or not. These stories and accompanying illustrations help to shape our understanding of what fairies are, what their peculiar rules and homes might be like, and what they want from us humans. As a result, the Feywilds in D&D take an enormous amount of influence from these tales. However, unlike the later, more safe versions popularized in the 1900s by Disney, the Feywilds maintained the dangerous and lethal elements that made Grimm's fairy tales popular. Lewis Carroll, author of Alice in Wonderland, also has their stamp on the aesthetics present in the Feywilds. The uncertain, treacherous and beautiful, playful nonsense that makes up the Feywilds could be likened to the psychedelic stories of Carroll and the psilocybin-induced trips that inspire those. Just while I've got your attention, I wanted to take a second, and I will be as brief as I possibly can, to say a massive thank you to my patrons over on Patreon. For those of you who don't know, channels like myself, and probably most other content creators, rely on Patreon to make the content that we do. This probably won't be a shock, but I spend the equivalent time of a full-time job working purely on Arcane Forge stuff, whether it's illustrating everything, spending time researching and writing scripts, which might take days, editing all the videos, and responding to as many of your comments as I possibly can. It takes up a while, basically. And while I absolutely love doing it, Myrtle has a hefty, hefty snack budget, and I want to make sure that the lights stay on here at the Arcane Forge. So if we were to meet in person, and you'd not think twice about buying me a cup of coffee, or a cup of tea, or something like that, then I'd urge you to head over to Patreon and help me out for perhaps the price of a cup of coffee. Just like these particular patrons, who this month are Aldrin, Christian Palmer-Smith, AJ, Dominique Jolly, Sam Hickson, Dan Waterman, Tamerling, Steve Harrison, Max Copeland, Styrax, Ryan H, Colby Monroe, Darth Gaetana, Max Schluter, Peter Balf, Alfie Wolf, Matt Lichtenwalner, Braxton Hudson, Cav Manick, Bartle Gruff the Great, Daniel Williams, Nathan Stratton, Ethan Dibby, Amanda and Jake Westfall, The Smiling Sadist, John Foster, Yorick Beese, Nap in Camo, George Punton, Raptor Dio, Nicholas G. Silver, and Duck Quack. In addition to helping me to actually keep making these videos, they get a bunch of rewards, some of which include things like chatting with me one-to-one -one every single month, and a bunch of others, but I'll make sure to leave a link down below so you can find out for yourselves. But anyway, thank you for your support, and for those who are paying for this content to be made, and paying for those viewers who can't afford to pay for this content to be made. You are all legendary, so thank you so much. And let's get back to the topic at hand. Where were we? The Feywilds are intimately and intrinsically connected to our plane of existence. We're told that portals to the Feywilds can be as overt as enormous stone gateways beset on either side by an archway of elven statues or mystical-looking trees, as we might expect when traversing realities in D&D, but they can also be incredibly covert and not at all obvious. Most commonly, adventurers and lost people might find themselves accidentally having crossed over into the Feywilds with no obvious means of escape. Think of Silent Hill when the fog rolls in. You might not be able to return quite the way that you came in. Most commonly, tying into the fairy tale inspirations of the Feywilds, bleeds in the veil of reality occur in densely forested areas. You might, 
much like poor Hansel and Gretel, go for a walk in some nearby but unfamiliar woodland or swamp and find yourself far from the material reality that you remember when you commence your journey. When I was a tour guide here in Scotland, we would often talk about this phenomenon. There are numerous sites all across the UK, although the ones I'm familiar with are in Scotland, where the boundary between the land of fairies and the land of humans become muddied and blended together. Two of the most notable sites, in Edinburgh at least, are Calton Hill, one of my very favourite walks, and Arthur's Seat. While I'm not a believer in the supernatural personally, I did always love how my old, and now sadly past Staffordshire Bull Terrier Bella, who was basically a sentient doble, with all the energy of a particularly hungover sloth, would suddenly become sprightly and puppy-like, sprinting and leaping into the air, rolling down grass banks on her belly, only when we took her to the top of Colton Hill. So maybe there was some magic up there after all. The story that we would tell on our tours regarding fairies and Colton Hill refers to the fairy boy of Leaf, which wasn't, surprisingly enough, Scottish people predicting my arrival, even though I did live in Leith. Leith is a district just on the boundary of Edinburgh, where this hill sits. And according to Nicky Laird of scottclans.com, the basic story of the fairy boy goes something like this. Quote, there was an old sea dog by the name of Captain George Burton living in Leith back in 1649, when visiting a friend named Maggie at his local hostelry, he was told the story of the little fairy boy. Every Thursday at midnight, this boy would go down to Carlton Hill and enter through large gates that were only visible to those with the fairy gift. There, he would go down into the hill and play his drums for the fairies to dance to and rejoice to. He would play faster and faster until he'd worked up such a frenzy that the assembly within the cavern would be transported to either France or Holland. Laughing, the captain asked, how could this be? And how did he know where they were? She replied, why, because the fairies have fur with pointy ears, the buildings look like flowers, and the rivers are gold. One Thursday, he was walking past the hostelry when Maggie shouted down from the window, pointing at a group of boys playing in the street. There he is, the fairy boy. Approaching the boy, he asked if he would like to join them and some friends to dine with him that evening. He agreed. When the boy arrived, the men decided to try and keep him distracted, so to miss his weekly appointment on Carlton Hill. However, at 11pm, he managed to slip by his captors, only to be seen in the street and brought right back. A second time, much closer to midnight, he managed to slip away again, but this time the men decided to follow him. When he was out of sight, they heard a piercing scream as if the boy was being attacked and slowly died away and the boy was never seen again. It's said that because the boy didn't arrive on time to play, he fell foul of the fairy's wrath. To this day, if you're walking near Carlton Hill on Thursday evening, you can hear drumming coming from within. End quote. In a town called Dal Rye on the west coast of Scotland, the exact town where my wife's side of the family happens to be from, no less, the entrance to Elfine, or Elfholm, is said to be in Cleves Cove Cave, also known as Blair Cove. This information was extracted through the torture and subsequent burning at the stake of a woman named Bessie Dunlop, the fabled queen of Elfheim, on November 8th, 1576. She was a midwife, a woman helping other women, a crime which was often misconstrued as witchcraft back in that time. The seamless boundaries between the Feywilds and the material plane are very common themes in Celtic, Pagan and Druidic legends and burial practices. Ancient Druids would often oversee the entombment of the dead in enormous burial mounds called Leoths or Raths. These over time would become overgrown and very closely resembled hills and due to their connection to nature and the theme of the dead crossing over into another life in another reality, merged to incorporate the idea that fairies might live there or guard those who are buried there. That's why more commonly these sites are referred to as fairy forts. As well as hills gaining a folklore connection to the fae, other natural sites were said to be portals to other worlds to the ancient druids. We have numerous brilliantly preserved and mummified remains of ancient humans who, as a part of their burial practices, were wrapped in fabric and submerged in bogs and marshes, under the belief that the surface of the water was a gateway to the afterlife 
and by returning a body to this water, people were ensured an easy passage into the next reality. So the Feywilds can be as easy to access as falling into a pool of water in a bog or marsh, getting lost in a densely wooded forest, cave or hill, but might be more deliberately accessed through intentionally created magical gateways if you so choose in your stories. As for escaping the Feywilds, once you're there, the logic and rules of that place are not 100% congruous with our own. Mechanically, if you're not native to that plane, you're not an elf, a satyr, or a goblin, for example, you can escape through the banishment spell, which will return you to your own reality. You could use plane shift or the gate spell, but those are fairly boring, exclusively mechanical means for those who are a fan of rules as written in D&D. But the Feywilds follow very confusing and poorly understood logic. They operate more in line with fairy tales and stories. As a result, they are usually full of rules that apply to your incarceration in the land of the Fey. You may need to complete an adventure of some kind, or do a favour for whatever creature or perhaps court of creatures has summoned you there, or perform some other more obscure and unknowable feat, like survive some predetermined length of time without eating anything from that plane of existence, like poor Persephone in the Greek legend of her abduction by Hades, the god of the underworld. If you do manage to abide by whatever unknowable rules hold you in this other realm, and aim to find another portal back to the material plane, they may resemble the situation which caused your arrival, but while the Feywilds and Material Plane can look similar in certain ways, they don't necessarily occupy the same space. So portals you exit through don't necessarily correlate to the same physical distance travelled on the Material Plane. You might travel through a portal, walk five feet, and exit through another, but when you return, you could find yourself on a different continent in the material plane, or even another planet. This is actually a tactic that a lot of fairies use to disorient travellers, opening portals which cause them to unknowingly travel in circles, getting more and more lost for weeks even at a time, all for their own twisted amusement. The Feywilds have a trippy, sort of dreamlike quality to them. To some, the largest influence when it comes to conjuring an idea of the Feywilds is to think of dreams, that the things that we dream of are conjured into reality, the confusing lack of logic that exists there, that you might be travelling down a street and then, without really considering it, you might already automatically arrive at your destination, that the creatures that chase you or help you in your dreams become born and materialise there. So the telling of folk tales and folk stories ingrains these things in the imagination of people, particularly of children. And when they dream of these folk stories, they physically conjure these creatures in the Feywild, birthing them into existence by accident. We can see this reflected to some extent in the Dungeon Master's Guide for 5th edition, where we're told that time operates peculiarly, a bit more like a dream, that when entering the Feywild, days might become minutes or hours, days might become weeks or months, or it might even reverse. That when leaving the Feywild, your memory of that place might become muddied or lost altogether. This lack of coherent concentration and lack of fundamental rules that we rely on in the material plane has a very serious impact on the nature of magic. Magic in D&D is drawn upon from various realities. When you cast a fire spell, you might be relying on some of the physical properties of our world to ignite the air, but it's more likely at higher levels you are accessing magic from the elemental plane of fire, for example. Enchantment spells and teleportation spells might be magical energy borrowed specifically from this dreamlike world of the Feywild. It is this magic that Archfey patron warlocks tap into when they cast almost any of their spells, but the peculiar and hard to control energies of the Fey are also said to be those that wild magic sorcerers and wild magic barbarians tap into when they use their magic. As a result, when travelling to the Fey Wilds, it's often a fun and disorienting idea to play a mischievous fey like prank on your players who are spellcasters. Wild magic sorcerers might find their magic perhaps more congruent and understanding allowing them to access their spells more easily and more readily, whereas the rest of the spellcasters who rely on the magic of our sensible material plane with its logic 
might find themselves at a loss, having to roll on the wild magic surge table every time they try and cast a spell. These are just optional ideas, of course, but it helps to cement the idea that logic as we understand it when traveling to the Feywild doesn't make sense, and the creatures who live there might also not apply any such social logic to their interactions, to their rules, and to what they find offensive enough to punish. There are a lot of conflicting aesthetics and ideas at play in how the Feywilds look. On one hand, we have the beautiful but unsympathetic majesty of nature overrun and overgrown. The untamable forest run rampant over the world, with none of humankind's order imposed on it. Then we have the ethereal beauty of Tolkien's elves, the majesty of their kingdoms and society tied to Celtic, Norse, pagan, and even to Slavic myths and folklore. On top of all of that, the somewhat whimsical, menacing, and confusing storybook logic of Grimm's fairy tales should add a sense of constant confusion, colourful danger, and of magic to this realm. I think that's kind of the theme, though. The Feywilds are a nonsensical dreamland. Rules cannot be imposed upon those lands, whether they are the rules of society or more fundamental physical laws that we understand in our reality. You might want to play with physics. Perhaps in the Feywilds, sometimes you can simply walk up the side of mountains as gracefully as you would if someone were to cast the spider climb spell on you. Perhaps in certain zones and in certain kingdoms, spells do the opposite of what you want them to do. Casting fireball might actually conjure a water cube, or even more nonsensically, wall of force might instead summon a wall of horse. Is When subjecting your players to the Feywilds, they should feel like they're in a dream that can be incredibly beautiful, illogical, ethereal, enchanting, but also dangerous, that the tone of this setting can flip in an instant to something horrifying and terrifying. There should be a constant sense of unease projected by their lack of control and understanding of the situation. Not that it's constantly cruel, or that the realm intrinsically wants to harm them, but perhaps more like travelling to another nation where you don't speak a single lick of the language, you don't know even the symbols of the alphabet, and the customs are wildly unlike your own. You have to muddle your way through and hope that you're doing the right thing, but that you might accidentally cause offence at any given time. But, rather than being able to apologise, the tone of this reality could punish you in ways that are incredibly severe, that defy all logic and reason, and are cruel, but ultimately unusual. But I want to talk about the Fae themselves, making bargains and pacts with them, and their peculiar laws and regulations in other videos, so I hope you'll stick around to watch those. And for the time being, I hope you enjoyed today's video and the artwork that I conjured up. If you did, please make sure to hit the little like button, favourite this video, and perhaps share it with the rest of your D&D party, because getting the word out is something that I rely on you guys to help with. If you love this image in particular, and you'd like to support the channel, I'd urge you to head over to my Patreon page, to which there is a link down below in the description box, because my patrons at certain levels get access to every single illustration that I do each month. But I hope you found this video informative, interesting, and beautiful, just like you. And until next time, happy monster hunting. <laughs>